As Steve said, um, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about this intersection between open source, working for a proprietary company, and working with communities. And just before I get started, I thought I, I'd resolve like a couple of contradictions that exist right here on my title slide. So I am going to be talking about open source. I do work for Microsoft. There's a, there's a contradiction right there. And at the end of my talk, I hope to resolve that particular one. Uh, even my title is a contradiction. I, I call myself at Microsoft an R community lead. And I do that because there is no official title at Microsoft for community. Uh, my official title is principal program manager or something like that, but I never use it. Um, so I chose um, the title R community lead not because I lead a community, like nobody leads a community, a community is still organized, um, but uh, at one point I had a team to, to work with communities, but now I don't have any employees, so thank you for that, um, which is awesome. Um, and, and, um, and yeah, so let me start by making a, a bold statement, and this is something that it's taken me kind of a long time to realize, but the value of software lies in the ecosystem that surrounds it. Now you can have the most elegant programming, you can have the most efficient system, you can have the killer features, but unless an ecosystem forms around that software, it's not gonna go anywhere. You know, the tech industry is just littered with the carcasses of solutions that were technically superior, but because they failed to form an ecosystem, never really took off. Um, the canonical example, I think, is Betamax from the VHS, you know, videotape era. In the software world, I actually reached out to Twitter to get some examples from people. Um, interestingly, one of the ones that came out was Usenet from our last talk. I don't think it was really technically superior. Maybe it was for the time. I do lament its loss, uh, but that concept didn't really take off after the Usenet era. Um, on the devices side, uh, Windows Phone 8, I think, is a great example. Uh, I never had one myself, I'm not a fan of them, but I had friends in Seattle that certainly were. It was really interesting living in Seattle and then flying up to, so living in San Francisco and then flying up to Seattle and saying, hey, people have Windows phones, what are those things? Um, <laughs> but um, apparently, good technology, good design, never formed an ecosystem, especially around app developers for, for populating the store around that, and as a result, didn't take off. Um, on the languages side and the operating system side, OS2, a great example. Um, Java, taking over from Smalltalk, another great example of technically inferior software winning out. Um, uh, let's see, what, what is also on the language side, Lisp. Too many parentheses, people can get into it, didn't take off. In the reverse direction, reverse Polish notation, not enough parentheses, people didn't take it off. But, but anyway, um, I, I think when I talk about ecosystem in this sense, it really comes to down these things. You, you've got to have the technical capability, of course. The software's got to work, it's got to be good. But unless you have these other things, I don't think that software has value, really pretty much by definition. Um, you know, one of those things, of course, is governance. Now, I'm talking about this in this talk in the context of open source software, primarily. Uh, but this does apply equally to, to licensed software or commercial software. But, in the context of open source, you know, is the project gonna be around in five years time if I'm gonna invest the time to build some kind of solution around it? Is the project managed uh, by a foundation or a group of people that are actually have a long-term view for how that software is gonna continue to evolve? Um, on the open source side, having vendor support. You know, are there companies that are going to stand behind that software and help you? Are there companies that are gonna provide technical support other companies that are going to provide services, provide training, all those kinds of things that are going to sort of reflect um, your investment in time and energy into working into that software. But the area that I'm going to focus around in this talk is around the community side of thing and community resources. I mean, that last talk, you know, really highlighted something for me that I hadn't even realized until today, is that, you know, one of the reasons why open source software has been so successful is very much because of that open... Uh, so what was the word we just used? I lost it. Um, oral history that applies in the open source world. You know, simply because open source is by definition open, and the fact that it can collect that open that oral history of information about how it was built and the designs and stuff like that, that doesn't really exist in the commercial world because it is living over in those silos. 
But I'm also talking here about things like uh, community wikis, uh, help pages, Stack Overflow, tutorials, all those kinds of collections of materials that the community puts together to help people to use that software. <coughs> The community also represents the talent field, uh, the talent pool associated with that software. If you're going to be building on a platform of any kind, you need to be able to find people that can work on that platform. And in the open source world in particular, having a sizable enough community built around it that can actually represent people that you can hire and bring in to use that software is an important part of its value. Because if you can't find people to work on it, there's no point using it in the, in the first place. And then lastly, with open source software, is the legal issues. You know, is the project under a standard open source license? Have people built up enough body of experience to understand how that license is applied? Is the legal team comfortable with using those types of licenses? Are there any patent encumbrances or issues like that? When those things have been understood and potentially resolved within an open source ecosystem, that in turn adds value uh, to that very software itself. So on that front, I want to give an example um, uh, from my own personal experience of the benefits of building community within an ecosystem. Uh, I am working on an open source project uh, called R. Uh, if you're not familiar with R, it is a programming language uh, that data scientists use to import data, do data manipulations, particularly build statistical models and predictive models and do data visualization. As Steve, as he mentioned, uses R for many of your blog posts and the analyses of the software rankings and so forth, which is awesome. Um, I got reached out to in 2007, I think, uh, by a company uh, which was just getting started at the time called Revolution Computing. And the idea of this company uh, was to build uh, a business around this open source software. I thought, that's great. Uh, I liked R. I'd been using it for a long, long time. Uh, I'm a statistician, so I'd been using it uh, in my work. Um, I think they reached out to me, in fact, because my name happens to be on the, uh, the introduction uh, manual that comes with R itself. I didn't write it, which is an interesting point of fact. Um, I actually wrote a manual in the early 90s for a predecessor language called S as I was riding around Australia in a combi van with my colleague Bill Venables teaching statistics to agronomists in the outback of Australia. Um, and this got rewritten with the letter R instead of the letter S because it was essentially the same language and suddenly I became the author of the manual without having actually been involved in the early days of the project. But I had been using it since, uh, since it sort of became uh, entrenched. So anyway, the, the people at Revolution Computing reached out to me, said, would you come over and be the community, community manager? And I said, what's a community manager? And they said, I thought you knew. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, we just kind of figured out, uh, thing, figured out things as we went along. There were two problems with building a business around this language. Uh, problem number one was nobody outside of academia knew anything about R at that time. Uh, it was used widely in the academic sector, particularly in statistics programs. People in postgraduate courses would do research, programming up new methods and algorithms using the R programming language. It was used in a lot of papers. But outside of a few niches within the financial world, R really wasn't known at all. Uh, the second problem that we had to deal with was that entire industry of statistical software use in industry uh, was absolutely dominated uh, by an 800 pound gorilla uh, the largest private software company in the world uh, called SAS. So we had a lot of uphill to go for to introduce people on the industry side to this new open source language. So one of the things that we decided to do uh, was to start a blog. Uh, we called it the Revolutions Blog. One of the best decisions I ever made was not to give it the company name because it went through three or four different company names as we had the blog, but it's still called Revolutions. Um, and we used this blog as a way of showcasing to the community, people that use R in this case, uh, what you can do with the R programming language, examples. Uh, in the very early days, it was difficult to find a lot of examples that people had used, but we used to do things like flip through academic journals and see a chart that, hey, that looks like that was done in R. Reach out to the author and say, did you use R? Said, yes, we did. And then we'd say, can we write about it? And we'd sort of showcase you know, interesting examples that way. The other thing that we did with respect to the blog was to write it in such a way that 
it was readable by some people in the business community. Because our secondary goal, in, in addition to providing a resource to the community of our users, was to show to people that were currently outside that community what was, what was potentially possible, what you could do with this new language, especially in contrast to the proprietary solutions that were already available. So we set up this blog in late 2008. Uh, we decided to do it daily. Uh, so every day there was some new information, which really pushed me personally to dig out there and try and find things to write about, especially in the early days. Uh, within a few years, though, people had started up uh, other blogs dedicated to this language. I think there's about 400 or so these days. So as, the end, as, as time progressed, it changed more from sort of investigative journalism, trying to find stories to write about, to actually selecting stories from all the stuff the community was generating to highlight things that were really most, most of interest more to the business audience. Um, R is used a lot for visualization. Um, if you've looked at the New York Times or The Economist or you know, all sorts of publications, a lot of that is, is doing R. So one of our big early stories came in 2009 uh, when The New York Times published this interactive chart about Michael Jackson just a couple of hours after he died. Um, it was really cool, actually, because uh, you can actually go back and look at his musical history, check out the, al uh, check out the albums, these little spark lines showing the performance of individual uh, hits over that time, and you could scroll through time. Um, I looked at that, and I can't remember whether it was Amanda Cox wrote on Twitter, she mentioned she was using R, I reached out to her and asked her, but anyway, it turned out that the New York Times had used this R programming language to develop this particular interactive application. It was very new for its time, and got it up on the New York Times website within three hours of Michael Jackson's death, without having any foreknowledge, of course, that this was going to happen. Um, so that was a really cool story. It really showed how people were using R for something interesting, something that wasn't sort of core statistics, and developing you know, uh, interactive applications really, really quickly. And I think that's a good lesson that at least I learned out of this process, is telling stories about how people use software is a really good way of communicating you know, what you can do with it. And we actually sort of turned that into an active process of seeking out stories of things people had done with the language and you know, um, rising heroes, if you want to put it that way, within the community to showcase what they were doing. Uh, we ran a series which we called the R Files for quite a long time. Uh, the guy there on the left you might recognize, his name's Hadley Wickham. Uh, he's probably the leading contributor to, to R these days. Um, at that time he was a, an assistant professor at Rice University. And you know, we went through lots of people in the community and tried to sort of showcase you know, what they were doing so that others could see. And again, this is the kind of thing that started to snowball as other people sort of came out and said, hey, I'm doing this kind of stuff, you know, can you write about me? And uh, that was a great way of building up the community. And I think another reason for, for, for doing this is that success breeds on success. Um, you know, especially in the early days, I remember Steve's you know, language rankings uh, I would come out pretty early, pretty high on that. There are all sorts of surveys about who was using R, and we could show a nice steady growth over time. And you know, one of the best ones, I think, in in in, in, in sort of my opinion, from a communications point of view, uh, was the IEEE Spectrum ranking of top programming language languages, which showed R as a very domain-specific language, ranking very highly amongst these general-purpose languages like C and Python. And and I think you know, just showing that success demonstrated to the community that working with the R language was beneficial to them, so they would continue to grow. It showed to the business sector that there were lots of successes using this language, and it was built and built and built that way. Another thing I'll mention, too, is that um, public relations works. And I say that not just because my husband is in the audience and he works in public relations, especially given that he's never forgiven me for not choosing his agency. Um, for, uh, for, for, for working with media and promoting some of these stories that we discovered in the blog. Um, but especially for a small company, you know, we were like 50 people at the time, uh, getting some of these stories out into the broader media uh, was really, really helpful. Uh, we had a front page on the business section of the New York Times, I think in 2008, about the R programming language, which really, really kicked things off. So just kind of a, a side point there. So we, we did a lot of this outreach and, and, and sort of community communication uh, with the blog and also with social media and email lists and all sorts of other things as well. But another thing that, that I think worked out well in retrospect 
in terms of building a community and thereby building an ecosystem around this, this sort of growing open source language uh, was local user groups, you know, working directly at the grassroots uh, to incentivize people to form their own little communities, little meetup groups, and talk about R on their own. When we started the program, which I think was in 2009 or so, um, there was only one R user group in the world. Uh, it was in the Bay Area. It was set up by a guy called Mike Driscoll. Um, did some really cool things. Uh, one of the things they did was actually have a, they crashed Stack Overflow at one point to populate it with questions about R, with <coughs> answers, and that was really, really good. But we wanted to sort of replicate that kind of experience in, in other places around the world. But as I said, we were a tiny company, 50 people. We didn't have any budget uh, really to speak of. So what we did was we set up a program where, you know, if you're an R user group, you know, number one, we will list it on the blog for you. Uh, but number two, if you want to set up an R user group, we'll send you a hundred bucks and some t-shirts and some goodies. And it was just amazing the number of people that would come through and, and, and do that with us, which was awesome. And then as the groups got bigger, we would give them 500 bucks and really big groups would get a thousand bucks. You know, it wasn't a lot of money. I think our annual budget for this was something in the order of $70,000, $80,000. Um, but it was amazingly effective in terms of building up that community and building up that ecosystem to the point where there are, I think, about 250 uh, user groups uh, dedicated to R around the world and many more dedicated to data science in general. And, you know, just on a, on a personal note, it was really fun to receive, you know, lots of photographs like this from people at the user groups. You know, that's a high school uh, up there on the top right-hand side where a teacher had introduced, you know, young kids to programming and data science using our language. We had a little mascot, which was a monkey, which would scream if you flung it, and people did all sorts of weird things with that. Uh, user groups, you know, all around the world. And, and I show you this just because, because, you know, it represents, you know, lots and lots of different things. You know, you know number one, obviously, it represents a grower user base. Um, it represents people giving presentations about the R language and, the, the slides that they posted at meetup.com uh, were enormously helpful in, again, finding more of those stories and sharing applications. Um, that has grown and grown and grown over time. And these days, it's videos that are really awesome. You know, to the, to the point earlier on, uh, you know, we recorded every single presentation that went on to the big R user group meeting in San Francisco this year. And that's just amazing <laughs> content that people share and share and share. But I think another, another way to look at this, though, is that especially for a company that's, that's trying to make money around this, this open source language and working with big businesses that are thinking about adopting it, is what these people represent. You know, none of these people are, are buying software. None of these people have budgets. None of these people are working at the executive levels in organizations. Uh, we would often come in you know, at that executive level and people come to us and say that we want to switch over to R as our platform for, for doing data science in the organization. But ultimately, as this progressed and progressed, the decision would get down to these data scientists, you know, at the technical levels that were working directly with the software, and having them say, yes, you know, we've heard of R, and we've heard of, we were revolutionality to that point. They sponsored our user group, you know, we know them, we trust them. You know, that, I think, was a huge part of the process of, of building the business by working from the grassroots up. But you've got to work from the top down as well. Um, another issue that we had in terms of trying to build a business around this open source software uh, was at the executive level, issues around risk. Um, this software, is it going to be around in five or 10 years? Is there an institution that controls it and manages it that's gonna be there for the long term? Uh, and in the case of R, that was a bit hard to show. Um, R is, is managed and developed uh, by a, a really excellent team of uh, statistical uh, analysts, computer scientists. Uh, they release the software regularly, they patch it regularly, they do a really good job of governing the system. Um, but their website looks like it comes out of 1993. <laughs> um, and when you try and show that at the executive level, they say, well, is this a real project or is it just something academic? Um, so what, and the other side of that coin was there were lots and lots of, at that point, big organizations uh, that were using R and that had built big systems around it but didn't have any way to show that and, in particular, didn't have any way to contribute back to the community uh, because the R Foundation that runs it, you know, 
doesn't really solicit for donations. It doesn't really sort of drive that side of things. So one of the things that we decided to do in conjunction with some of the other companies that were working around the art language was to create a consortium. Uh, we called it the Art Consortium. Uh, it, was a it is a trade group consisting of members from the big vendors uh, that work with the art language. They contribute money with annual dues. And then that money goes back into the community. We solicit proposals from the community about what would you like to develop uh, around the R language. Uh, kind of a, a sort of a side note here, but one of the really nice th things about R as a language is it's really easy to extend uh, through something called packages. And most of the development in R at a technical level these days happens outside of the core language in these packages. So we can facilitate that really easily uh, through this consortium. And I think once this started up and once people started to see names like Microsoft and IBM and Google and RStudio, which is one of the big developers around R, um, involved together with this, I think that really upped the confidence level around adopting it as a platform and it helped to build that ecosystem on the governance side, which gave some confidence for, to people that were adopting it uh, at the business level. So at this point, I'd like to pause a little bit and just admit that I know it seems like we've been awfully prescient and doing the right things, but we had no idea. Um, so this is all sort of retroactive continuity, you know, kind of like that time in Star Trek in 2005 when they suddenly decided the Klingons were working with human DNA to retroactively explain why they looked like us. You know, this is me here right now, so just saying that everything that we did with the community uh, was awfully strategic, but in truth, it was really just that we wanted to do the right thing. You know, we thought since we were building a business around these volunteers and this open source software, the right thing to do was to try and contribute back uh, in any way that we feasibly could, you know, through our community programs. And, you know, in retrospect, you know, it, it, it did work. Um, I think there, there was some consternation even within our organization around doing that, especially from salespeople who said to us all the time, why are you promoting this free software? Like, I've got this deal in the, in the, in the, in the, in the can, um, but they're going to go off and just use the free stuff. You know, they're not going to pay us for service. They're not going to pay us for our add-ons. What's the deal with that? And I think if I had been ex able to explain then, what I think I understand now is that ultimately by building up the community, by supporting the community, by building that trust, by growing the community, you grow the available, eco you grow the ecosystem around the community, and that's ultimately beneficial both to the community and to the vendors that are working on that software. But I guess we did something right. Uh, we ended up getting acquired uh, by Microsoft uh, a little over a year ago, back in April. Uh, that was a very weird time for me. Uh, I've been working in open source pretty much all, all of my life, and I'm one of these people that kind of didn't really trust Microsoft. Uh, I might have called them the Borg once or twice. Um, and I, I was apprehensive about this idea of coming from an open source world to working uh, at a company like Microsoft. But one thing I will say is that it's been a really real pleasant surprise. Um, I think anything I've learned over the last year is that Microsoft's a very different company than it was you know, even just a couple of years ago. Uh, Windows used to be king. Uh, now everything is cloud and mobile. And as long as people are doing something in the Microsoft ecosystem, then people at Microsoft are happy. So I've been getting great support around these open source programs and these community programs. And I think that's coming you know, from the top one down from Sacha, which is awesome. So I just wanted to conclude here with a slide uh, that I stole from one of my colleagues in the DX team. He sent it to me and it didn't have the Microsoft confidential do not distribute slapped all over it. So I figured it's okay to show it. Um, and, and I think it reflects you know, um, community is a very different thing at Microsoft than, uh, than it was before. The DX team is responsible for developers. It stands for developer experience. And that was Microsoft's community program for, for a long, long time, it was working with developers that were working directly with Windows and Office and all the Microsoft platforms, .NET example. Um, but now that it's changing towards people using any type of software, you know, in the cloud or on the Microsoft stack, and it's changed the way that I think, uh, slowly is changing the way, it's probably a better way to put it, the way that Microsoft is looking at community. You know, rather than going in with an agenda, like use our stuff, it's about enabling the success of people that work in those communities. And you know, rather than just sort of pushing out, you know, rising up you know, a whole bunch of uh, user groups from the ground up, built around the Microsoft products, it's more about helping people be, uh, 
um, and measuring it through community satisfaction and how much they share um, their results. So for me, you know, being a community guy within Microsoft, you know, this has all, all been a, a great sign. So just to wrap up, you know, just with a, with a few of the community building tips that, that I, I've learned over the years, I think number one is be human. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about doing the blog is doing it my way, doing it under my own name, sharing things that are of interest to me, you know, with the hope that they're of interest to others. I've worked with a lot of guest bloggers over the years, and I've always encouraged them, write under your own name, write what you want to write about, share your personal experiences as you go. Because I just think people at, at the community level and at every level relate so much more to people than they do to companies. And again, sorry, Jay in the background. And that's also why I hate press releases. I just think press releases are useless <laughs> because they're the exact opposite of that. Um, tell stories and promote heroes. You know, I think that's a great way of reaching out to the community and, communi and communicating with the community. And also building that trust that you need to make all of this work because you know, through that communication you can, you can be listening to people, you can show that you listen, show that you've heard, you can, promoting diversity is a really, really big part of that and showing you've heard the concerns of the community. And using these programs to, using the, the, these ways rather, to, to earn trust, but also to have trust in the community. I think one of the worst things you can do is try and direct community members to do what you want them to do. I think it's a much better idea just to trust in the community itself. Let them self-organize, let them do the things they want, and then learn from what they do you know, through their resources and so forth. Because all of this stuff is ultimately enhancing the ecosystem as a whole by strengthening the community, by growing the community, uh, by providing those resources, you're in turn increasing the value uh, of what you do and your programs. Just by the way, uh, a lot of this also comes from The Art of Community. If you're interested in this topic, read The Art of Community by John O'Bacon. Uh, it's a great book, but that's all for me. Thank you.